sometimes there are some subtleties of maybe having some CH bonds or maybe things like carbon dioxide at least are excluded. But fundamentally, organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon compounds. And up until the beginning of the 19th century, people thought that there was an inexorable divide between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. That only living things could make organic chemicals. And in 1828, Friedrich Fuller broke this paradigm and showed that he could make urea, not from kidneys, not from a human being or a dog, but in the laboratory from inorganic chemicals. And that was a major paradigm shift. And then the chemical industry later, off in the, later on in the 19th century took off with the dye stuff industry. It used to be that all of the dyes for clothing could only come from plant sources and animal sources like uh, shells and, and beetles. And then it was discovered that all of these beautiful chemicals could be made in the, or all of these beautiful pigments could be made in the laboratory. And now all of these wonderful purples and pinks and reds and so forth that we take for granted are relatively cheap synthetic chemicals. Health has always been an important part of organic <coughs> chemistry, and in fact, the dye stuff industry came from a chemist attempt, very crude attempt, a chemist named Perkin, to make a chemical compound that was used to treat malaria, quinine. Malaria was a big problem throughout the world, it still is in many parts of the developing world, not in the US right now, thank goodness. But quinine was the only treatment, and that came from the bark of a plant. And so Perkin tried to make quinine in the laboratory and instead got a beautiful purple compound. And being clever, he realized sometimes when you do an experiment and you don't get the result that you see, you could actually do even better with the discovery that you found, and thus the dye stuff industry was born. Health has continued with antibiotics, with compounds to treat diseases like AIDS, and these are all products of the chemical industry. In fact, many of the PhD students who come through our program, like Johnny and Buck, will go on to careers in the pharmaceutical industry helping to invent the next generation of medicines that fight disease. So I've mentioned some organic chemicals. I've mentioned urea. I've mentioned dyes. I've mentioned antibiotics. I've mentioned drugs to fight other diseases. What are some other organic chemicals? <coughs> Alcohol. Alcohol, a great favorite. Later on, you will be learning about NMR spectroscopy. And the first NMR, not in our class, but in the B course, and the first NMR spectrum, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum, the technique that now is very similar to the medical technique you've heard of as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. The very first nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum was recorded on ethyl alcohol. <coughs> what are some others? Ethane. Ethane. We will be learning about ethane and other alkanes, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane, dodecane, undecane, 
etc. When we start talking about alkanes, which I think is going to be either yeah, in October, I believe, and maybe be into November, that will provide us into a platform on some of the big concepts I'm going to be talking about some other organic chemicals. Sugar. Sugar! Fantastic! Not only is sugar sweet, but it is an important component of many living systems. On the surface of cells in your body, there are sugars that are attached. Different types of sugars make you, you, literally. So in your blood group, whether you're A or B or O, you're going to have different types of sugars attached to your cell surfaces. And in turn, your immune system is going to recognize whether you have sugars for the A blood group or the B group, group which is why if you're A, you can't get a, a transfusion from B, and if you're B, you can't get a transfusion from A. Sugars are also an important part of another biological molecule that is literally central to life, central to your genetic identity. What is that organic chemical compound? DNA. All right, sugars, Nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are two of the biggies for biomolecules. What's the third biggie? Proteins. So, everything from synthetic compounds like antibiotics, to alcohols, to useful things like natural gas and all of the things that derive from petroleum, which includes the plastic and many of the fabrics in your chairs, your nylon backpacks, and so forth are all coming from petroleum, to biomolecules like sugars and denucleic acids and peptides and proteins are all central to organic chemistry. And this is why, even if you aren't a chemist, it is so important to learn a little bit about organic chemistry. Well, today, I'm going to give you the three things that you need to know for the entire rest of the year. Then you can take all your final exams and graduate. So, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. This will at least give you the cocktail conversation of the three things that you will need to know. But seriously, three concepts that are going to come up and actually be central throughout all three quarters. And we will touch on them all this quarter. Stereochemistry. The three-dimensional structure of molecules the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms in space. <coughs> this is where organic chemistry gets fun. We're completely different than general chemistry. That's why we actually get to play with these molecular models, because there is very little other than a tangible molecular model that you can rotate and manipulate that can get things into your brain so well. I work with some very big mole molecules, and sometimes it's not practical for me to make a plastic model. So I use computer-based models. But to get it really into my brain, I'll put on 3D glasses so I can see it in 3D, because nothing replaces that three-dimensional relationship of being able to rotate and manipulate and so forth. And we will use our plastic molecular models to help us learn about this, to learn about the shapes of molecules, and so forth. The 
second big concept of organic chemistry is functional groups. These are collections, small collections of atoms that have specific properties. So for example, alcohol, which commonly re is, uh, refers to ethyl alcohol, has very similar properties to methanol, methyl alcohol, and isopropanol, isopropyl alcohol, because they all contain the hydroxy functional group. This group of an OH imparts very similar properties to the molecule. This is a powerful concept because it means if you can predict or if you know the properties of one molecule with a functional group, you can predict properties of other molecules with, func with that functional group, chemical properties and physical properties. Ethanol is much higher boiling than, say, propane, because the alcohol groups hydrogen bond together. It's also much higher boiling than ethane. I took propane because it's the same, roughly the same number of atoms. Methanol also has a higher boiling point. Ethanol mixes with water. Methanol mixes with water. We will learn about functional groups throughout the three quarters, like carboxylic acids, ketones, aldehydes, carbonyl functional groups, and so forth. And you will see that one molecule, knowing the behavior of the functional group, can allow you to predict and understand the properties of many, many different molecules. And so that is why this is such an important concept. This is different than general chemistry because we are seeing more in the way of patterns. And this is where organic chemistry really opens up to people, where they say, well, I didn't really like all that calculator stuff and the logs and the, um, and the various equations and the nernst equation and so forth of general chemistry. And they get turned on when they see these patterns in organic chemistry. The last big concept this curved arrow notation reactivity of organic chemis chemicals is all about flow of electrons and if you understand where the electrons are and what wants to get electrons who has the electrons and who wants the electrons, that's, these are properties of functional groups, then you can figure out how different molecules react. And curved arrows are ways that we show the flow of electrons that in turn shows us where bonds form. Because when you share a pair of electrons, you form a covalent bond. When you take away a pair of electrons, you break a covalent bond. And so we are going to use a very simple notation, like so, to show electrons flowing from something that has electrons to something that wants electrons. 